Hello, everyone. We are going to continue along with Chapter 9. Chapter 9 is discussing emotions. We're going to look at the concepts of what are emotions, the influences on emotional expression, expressing our emotions effectively, and then how do we manage our emotions. These are the learning objectives that we're going to cover. We're going to explain how emotions are experienced and expressed, describe the various personal and social influences on an emotional expression, demonstrate how to express your emotions appropriately and effectively. We're going to distinguish between facilitative and debilitative emotions and explain how repraisal may be used to manage emotions effectively. So first off, what are emotions? Could you imagine how different your life would be if you lost the ability to experience emotions? An emotion is, emotionless world would include being free of boredom, frustration, fear, loneliness, and all the negative emotions that we feel but you would also lose your ability to feel joy, pride, excitement, and love. So I doubt most of you would wanna make that trade off if you couldn't feel all the positive things that we're able to experience. Daniel Goleman coined the term emotional, emotional intelligence, and this is used to describe the ability to understand and manage one's own emotions and to be sensitive to other people's feelings. I'm sure you probably have heard about the ability to have emotional intelligence. And some people I think are maybe better at being sensitive to other people's feelings and being more in touch with their emotions. Goldman maintains that the, the that success depends in great parts on your emotional intelligence emotional intelligence quota and in support of that claim studies show that emotional intelligence is positively linked with your self-esteem and your life satisfaction as well as your healthy conflict communication and your empathetic listening abilities and effective workplace interactions. So much, you know, so that emotional intelligence is even used in some part to measure if you can get a job or this is something that some people use when they're looking for employees. There are several components to, you know, how humans label emotions. So physiological changes, these are your bodily changes, such as increased heart rate, a rise in your blood pressure, that kind of feeling of being warm all over. This can occur when you have really strong emotions. I'm not sure if you've ever been so mad that maybe you feel like your blood is boiling. That could be a physiological response or nonverbal behavior can include when you blush maybe because you're embarrassed or you know something happens maybe you sweat because you feel nervous maybe your posture or your gesture will change maybe you start to speak really quickly when you feel anxious or in a certain type of situation Maybe the tone of your voice changes. Maybe you get really loud or maybe qu really quiet, depending on how you're feeling. These are all different nonverbal behaviors that can occur based on your emotions and your emotional state. And then we also have cognitive interpretations that affect emotions because our mind plays an important role in determining how we feel. So repraisal, thinking the meaning of events, which is altering their emotional impact, and then verbal expressions may be necessary to communicate feelings, sometimes referred to as effect labeling.
So anger, joy, fear, sadness, and disgust are common and typical emotions. And we use specific emotion, emotive words to represent, uh, you know, very varying degrees of the of the intensity of these. And then again, kind of continuing with this, what is em emotions and the verbal expression of it. So you when you look at this diagram right here, so research supports the notion that we experience emotions not just in the mind, but throughout the body. As the figure below shows, disgust may turn our stomachs, fear can tighten our chest, and happiness can make us feel warm all over. Noticing phys physiological sensations such as these can affect a significant clue to your emotions. And then it kind of shows the anger, fear, disgust, happiness, sadness in the diagram here to represent that. And this shows the different body temperatures associated with each of these emotions and what it looks like on those, uh, you know, as our body changes. And then kind of what I already mentioned, verbal expression, anger, joy, fear, sadness are the common uh, typical emotions and specific emotion words that represent varying degrees and in intensity. So what are some influences on emotional expression? So we are all born with the ability to reveal our emotions, but over time we develop differences in how we express, express our emotions. And what are some things that kind of influence this and change how we express ourselves emotionally? So, you know, babies smile, they frown, they giggle, and they cry whenever the mood might strike them. But over time, you know, the differences that develop in our emotional expression could start with um, our culture. So people around the world experience the same emotions, uh, and although the same events can generate quite different feelings in each of the different cultures. So in an individualism versus collectivism spectrum, that can influence their emotional expression. Individualists are quite frank about expressing negative emotions towards outsiders, whereas in a collectivist culture, they are more likely to hide emotions, especially if they dislike something. And something else that can make a difference can be Gender roles, uh, you know, gender roles often shape the way in which men and women uh, experience and express their emotions. There's, you know, some truth to the cultural stereotype of inexpressive male and, you know, more expressive females. Men and women experience the same emotions, but there are differences in the way that they read and express them openly. And the same thing as far as in the culture. Uh, so like the notion of eating snails might bring a smile of delight to some residents of France, but it might cause North Americans to be disgusted about it. So, you know, culture can have a big effect on that too. In one study, they found that Asian Americans and Hong Kong Chinese, uh, they value they value being calm, relaxed, and peaceful, while European Americans, by contrast, tend to value um, excitement, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, and elation. And then it says that the United States is known internationally as a culture of cheerfulness. They said that the U.S. is tend to be known as expressing itself in 
saying, wow, great, how nice, that's fantastic. I had a terrific time, it was wonderful. So they always think that Americans are so like happy and cheerful. That's what, uh, you know, the U.S. is known for, which is interesting. So another thing that also can make a difference is social conven conventions and our roles. In mainstream U.S. society, the unwritten rules of communication discourage the direct verbal expression of most emotions count the number of genuine emotional expressions you have heard over a two or three day period and you'll discover that such expressions are generally rare people are generally comfortable making statements of fact and often delight in expressing their opinions but they rarely disclose how they are actually feeling they tend to act out rather than talk out their emotions which i i, I mean i don't think you probably find that very surprising in your daily life. I'm sure you see this. Not surprisingly, the emotions that people do share directly are usually the positive ones. Like, I'm happy, I really enjoyed this, I really like this. So people are more likely to, to share the good things that are happening. They're trying to talk about happy things to one another and you know show the happy side of their life. Scholars offer detailed descriptions of the way contemporary society discourages expression of anger. North Americans today strive to suppress this unpleasant emotion in almost every context, including uh, the workplace, personal relationships. So basically, you know, it's it's kind of frowned upon for us to express anger or to show anger that emotion in particular is kind of frowned upon. An emotional labor describes managing and suppressing emotions where appropriate or necessary. So you're essentially managing your emotions in appropriate situations. At work, it's going to be appropriate to show one type of emotion and manage the situation to what is appropriate in these different types of situations you might you know, change or suppress how you're actually feeling. They did kind of talk about too, uh, you know, in mediated communication, communicators generally express more online than they will in person. So people feel more comfortable about being open uh, in social media channels. Maybe they'll share more through texting in, you know, instances like that where it's not a face to face environment, which I'm sure you probably can think of examples or reasons why people feel comfortable doing this. It's easier to, you know, sit behind your computer, sit behind your phone and post a picture about something or talk openly about something. Maybe when you don't have to do it in a face to face environment, it's, you know, you can be more open or vulnerable and feel comfortable about it. And social media can feed emotional responses. Both the senders and the receivers experience emotions more intensely online. But you also have to be cautious about that because it, that's out there for everybody to see. You know, you don't want to get in arguments with people online or feed into these type of, of you know negative situations. But it could be good that maybe you use social media as an outlet to express you know your emotions that maybe you otherwise would be unable to share just you know within reason whoops they talked about emotional contagion is the process by which emotions are transferred from one person to another so it's kind of like feeding other people and transferring your emotional feelings so you know they said we catch feelings from one another as though there were some kind of social virus 
there's evidence this contagion can happen between students and teachers, customers and employees, and even husbands and wives. You could probably recall instances in which being around a calm person made you feel more at peace or whenever you're with someone who was in a positive mood, maybe that made you feel like more positive or the opposite can be true. If you're around somebody who feels really negative or they're in grouchy, maybe it makes you feel more grouchy and negative and when you maybe didn't feel like that before. And the issue is this can also take place online like we were just talking about. In an analysis of millions of status updates on Facebook, researchers found that posts about rain, which, which typically correlated with negative moods, can have a ripple effect on the readers. Those exposed to their friends rating day messages began posting more emotionally negative updates, even if it wasn't raining in their area, <laughs> which is so crazy it, if they saw sad post about rain and it being dreary outside then therefore it made them feel sad or dreary and it kind of like rubbed off on them and then the same thing is if they saw a lot of positive posts those were contagious too and they found more positive status updates so it really can make a difference the type of people that you're following and the type of content that you're being exposed to online if you're only reading negative things online, on social media, on whatever, it's probably gonna make you feel more negative. If you're only reading positive things online or, or that's the type of accounts that you're following, then it might help you feel more uplifted and more positive. And you know that can make a difference in your overall mental state and your overall mood. So how do we express our emotions effectively? Like, what can we do about these things? And, you know, what else can we do to help avoid some of these things? Another thing also that it did talk about on the previous slide that I didn't go much into is kind of like emotional labor on the job. So the rules for expressing emotions in the workplace are very different from how we express our emotions in our personal life. And the same for like in intimate relationships. So it's very important to distinguish, you know, what's appropriate at work versus what's appropriate, you know, in your personal life. So you wanna manage and suppress emotions to make sure that you're not, reacting in an inappropriate way, but and they give examples. They say, if firefighters don't mask their emotions of fear, disgust and, and disgust and stress, it impedes their ability to help the people whose lives are they are trying to save. So they have to have emotion management training and this is vital for, for the new firefighters who are trying to save people in a fire. And the same thing if correctional officers are at you at prisons, they have to manage their uh, emotions with inmates and try to juggle the conflicts that they encounter, or they won't be able to do their job effectively. So again, going back to how do we express our emotions effectively and also manage them in these different environments, you need to recognize your own feelings and you must be aware of how you're feeling and be able to identify emotions correctly in order to communicate skillfully and you need to choose the best language so many suffer from you know not having uh, the correct emotional vo vocabulary and you need to share multiple feelings. It is common to experience more than one emotion at a time. We usually only express one emotion. Sometimes maybe it's the most negative one, but you're not always just experiencing one thing. So you need to try to sort through that and share 
all the things that you're feeling and work through find me the language to be able to do that and then you need to recognize the difference between feeling and acting just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean you should always act on it accept responsibility for your feelings but don't blame other people for how you feel just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean that it's somebody else's fault you, why are you feeling that way? Did something trigger you to feel that way? Was it an experience? Is it, I mean, there's multiple things that can occur and it doesn't mean that somebody else did this to you to make you, you know, feel how you are feeling in that situation. So we shouldn't just instantly blame somebody for the situation. Choose the best time and place to express your feelings, which is just what I was saying at work in a certain situation, it might not be appropriate. It might harm somebody else, depending on the type of job you have. But let's think about doctors and nurses, like they're trying to save people. Yes, life happens, but it, it could affect your ability to save somebody or do your job effectively. And if it is something at that point that you are so emotional, you need to recognize that you're unable to complete your job right now. and you know, you need to let someone know that you're unable to do your, you know, your work because of the emotional state that you're currently in. So again, recognizing that and then choosing the best time and place to express this. Maybe you need to express it later in a safe space. Maybe it's something you don't need to, you know, express at all. Maybe it's going to depend on the situation. Maybe you need to wait till you get home. There's so many different circumstances on how this could occur and when. And, you know, use your words. You try to find the right words to put your emotions in how to communicate them, which I that can be difficult. I know sometimes when you're feeling so overwhelmed and super emotional, I know some people just shut down. They don't know how to express how they're feeling. It feels really overwhelming. And you don't really know what to say or how to express it at that at that point of what you're feeling. So, you know, how do we manage all of these different emotions that we're, we're experiencing? So facilitative emotions contribute to effective functioning while debilitative emotions hinder or prevent effective performance. Debilitative emotions are more intense than facilitative emotions. Debilitative feelings also have more of an extended duration. And you can also have reoccurrent thoughts uh, not demanded by the immediate environment that just keep happening. Thoughts cause feelings. The rational emotive approach to changing feelings is to rethink unproductive interpretations of them. The key to understanding and changing feelings lies in repraised defense repraising events through our self-talk. So self-talk is kind of these things that you're kind of telling yourself, the non-vocal internal monologue that is your process in thinking. We all kind of have that like little voice in our head that is telling us things all the time. Might be telling you how you're feeling that day, you know, what's part of your self-esteem, part of, you know, your day-to-day -day thoughts. It's your internal monologue. And you have to kind of re-change that self-talk if it's continual dehabilitative emotions and thoughts that are continuing to be negative. Because these thoughts can kind of cause these negative feelings. You know, when you look at emotions in this way, many people may believe that they have little control over how they feel. However, the casual relationship between activating events and emotional discomfort isn't as great as it seems. Cognitive psychologists and therapists argue that it's not events such as meeting strangers that cause people to feel poorly, but rather the beliefs that they hold about these events. 
consider this, this example to understand how thoughts can cause feelings. Imagine you start receiving a string of angry, insulting messages from a friend. Under the circumstances, it is likely that you would feel hurt and upset. Now imagine that after receiving these offensive messages, you learn that your friend has been hospitalized for a mental illness. In this case, your reaction would probably be very different. Most likely you would feel sorrow and compassion, and you might even be embarrassed forever imagining that your friend would turn against you so quickly for no reason. In this story, the event was being called, you know, mean names and in, in, in these text messages. And it was the same event in both cases, yet the emotional consequences were very different. The reason for different feelings has to do with a pattern of thinking in each case. In the first instant, instance, you would most likely think your friend was angry with you and that you had done something terrible to deserve a response. In the second case, you would probably feel sim sympathy given that your friend had experienced some sort of you know, psychological difficulty. So, you know, these are different instances and responses. So, you know, the key is understanding and changing feelings in the, the events that take place and, you know, through the self-talk that we, we kind of have. And then irrational thinking and dehabilitative emotions. Many de de dehabilitative feelings come from accepting irrational thoughts or fallacies. And there are multiple fallacies that people accept that cause these, you know, these emotions that we continue to believe. So the process of self-talk is essential to understanding the debilitating feelings that interfere with effective communication. Many debilitating feelings come from accepting these irrational thoughts. And here are some of the fallacies. The first fallacy that many people may believe is the fallacy of perfection. And you believe that a worthwhile communicator should be able to handle any situation with complete confidence and skill. And although such a standard of perfection can serve as a goal and a source of ins inspiration, it's unrealistic to expect that you can reach or maintain this level of behavior because the truth is that nobody can be perfect. People who believe that it is, you know, desirable or possible to be perfect at communicating or acting this way, they won't ever appreciate you know, if something is imperfect or when things happen and it will be really difficult for them to admit to mistakes. And so, you know, you have to really say, I made a mistake and that's okay. But instead, some people will get into these dehabilitative emotions and say, I made a mistake, I'm a failure. And that can lead to, you know, negative thoughts. And you need to change your self-talk with, I made a mistake, I'm human, that's okay. I learned something for it. I learned something from this mistake and next time I'll change it to do this. Instead of believing that you're a failure or negative things. The next fallacy that people fall into is the fallacy of approval is so this is the idea that uh, that you want to obtain everybody's approval communicators who believe this go to incredible lengths to seek acceptance from others even to the extent of satisfying or to sacrificing their own principles or happiness to try to make other people accept them so these people are really seeking acceptance from everybody, but this can lead to, you know, you sacrificing your own happiness or your own principles 
and you feeling disappointed or still feeling feeling like people don't like you. And so you kind of have to give up on this and, um, you know, abandon this idea that everybody has to like you all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to live a life of being selfish. It is important to consider the needs of others, but it's also important to think about yourself and realize that you only need the respect of certain people and the people around you that love you. And that's, you know, the important people in your life. You don't need everybody to like you. And you also need to make sure that you're thinking about your own principles and your own happiness and not, you know, sacrificing those to get approval from other people. Then we have the fallacy of should. And this is the inability to distinguish between what is and what should be. For instance, imagine a person who is a, who is full of complaints about the world. There should be no rain on the weekends. Money should grow on, on, on every tree. We should all be able to fly. Beliefs like this are obviously foolish because we hold these kinds of expectations for others all the time. He shouldn't be so inconsiderate of other people. She should stand up for herself. They should all work harder. So you're constantly, you know, focused on what other people should be doing and what should happen. And so this is just unrealistic behaviors and thinking. So rather than expecting others to behave the way you think they should and feeling disappointed when they don't meet that standard, it's more realistic to think, I wish he or she would behave the way I want, but maybe I'm being unrealistic to expect that behavior, you know, and so don't th think that people are going to do what you want them to do and they feel disappointed after the fact. Next, we have the fallacy of overgeneralization occurs when a person bases a belief on a limited amount of evidence. In statements like, I blanked during the speech, I'm so stupid. Some friend I am, I forgot my best friend's birth birthday. These examples focus on a single shortcoming and then you kind of apply that it represents everything else about you or a situation. And so you're kind of, you know, punishing yourself or the situation because you're overgeneralizing. A single memory lapse, you know, doesn't mean that you're stupid because you blanked out during a speech. And forgetting one event doesn't make you a bad friend. You know, on closer examination, such absolute statements are almost always false and usually lead to discouragement or anger. It is better to replace overgeneralization overgeneralizations with more accurate messages, which are likely to generate generate less negative feelings. And then we have the fallacy of causation is the belief that one should not do anything that will cause harm or inconvenience to others because it will cause undes undesirable feelings. For example, you might not tell your family members that they've interrupted you several times because you don't want to make them angry. Some, you know, it might be tempting to not avoid bringing up issues with friends and coworkers because you don't want to cause a negative reaction. So you basically don't, you know, want to rock the boat. Or maybe you don't speak out in, you know, these types of situations just because you don't want to have negative emotions or, you know, kind of deal with any disappointing feelings, confusion, or irritation. And so, you know, that 
could definitely cause some problems as, as well. Next, we have the fallacy of helplessness, and that suggests that forces beyond our control determine satisfaction in our life. So people with this outlook continually see themselves as victims. There's no way I can get ahead in this society. The best thing I can do is to accept it. I was born with this personality and I wish I was more outgoing, but nope, there's nothing I can do. Too bad. I can't tell my boss that he's putting more demands on me. Um, if I did, I, I might lose my job. So the error in these statements is pretty apparent once you realize that you know, few paths are completely closed and many difficulties a person claims can't be solved and, you know, they usually do have solutions. The task is to discover what, what those solutions are and to really work at trying to change them. You need to change your self-talk and see that there are choices and try to feel more positive about the choices that you have instead of feeling like you're helpless and that you don't ever have a choice uh, in your situation. Because if you constantly believe that you are helpless, that you don't have a choice, that you're stuck in the situation that you have, then nothing you know, will change because you're not going to make a change about it. And then the fallacy of catastrophic expectations occurs when one assumes that if something bad can happen, then it will. And so some pe fearful people operate on the assumption, you know, that always expecting the worst case situation. And so some of the statements they might make are, if I invite them to the party, they're probably not going to come. If I speak up to try to resolve a conflict, things are going to get worse. If I apply for the job I want, I'm not going to get hired. If I tell them how I feel, they probably are just going to laugh at me. So you're basically imagining every terrible situation and every terrible con, you know, consequence that can occur. And it kind of starts a self-fulfilling prophecy. And one study revealed that people who believe that their romantic partners would not change for the better were likely to behave in ways that contributed to a breakup of the relationship. And so if you always believe that these negative things are going to happen, then you might even do things to make them happen. So how can you minimize these emotions, these dehabilitative emotions, especially if you fall into one of these areas that we just talked about. You have to monitor your emotional reactions. You have to know the specific event. So if you have a trigger that kind of triggers you to go down this path and starts to lead you into one of these negative areas, be aware that something is usually likely to trigger you to make you feel that way or to start thinking negatively. Kind of pay attention to your self-talk and try to start monitoring to change your self-talk. And dispute your irrational beliefs. Repraise them. So if you start disputing these irrational beliefs that you have, choose an alternative belief that maybe is more sensible and you know more positive once you realize that you're being irrational about something. So when changing your self-talk, start replacing words like can't, have to, and should with words like will, want to, choose to. and then maximizing facilitative emotions. So emotional agility allows repraisal of challenging situations as opportunities for growth. So you really look at it as this is a way for me to grow, to improve, to do better. And you look at it kind of like as a learning experience to improve. 
focus on what you've gained rather than what you lost. So, you know, when people focus on the negative and the things that are, are all bad, focus on rather, this is what I'm getting. This is how I've improved. This is how much I've grown. Choose compassion over contempt. And the 10 emotions that are basic to positivity are joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and love. So those are the emotions that will really help you to go more towards positivity and remain positive. And this is a review of some of the objectives that we covered related to emotions, explain how emotions are experienced and expressed, describe the various personal and social influences on emotional expression, describe how to express your emotions appropriately and effectively, Distingu distinguish between facilitative and debilitative emotions, and explain how reprisal may be used to manage emotions effectively.